This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Several years ago, there was a newspaper account of an exciting movement which was taking place in Israel. A conservative sect of Judaism, one that studied the prophecies related to the coming of a Messiah, had put together recent current events and had come to be convinced that the coming of Messiah was near. In fact, some rabbis went so far as to give the exact time and hour when he would appear on the hill of Zion the site of the temple of Jesus' day. And so on that day, more than 5,000 people singing, shouting, and praying made their way to the old foundation stones of the temple area. At the Wailing Wall, which was actually standing in the days of Herod, they gathered to await the coming of the Messiah. But he did not come that night. However, the expectation continues to burn in their hearts that the Messiah will come. This hope for a coming Messiah was not limited to Judaism. As you know, our Christian faith proclaims that Messiah did come in the person of Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago. The idea of hoping and waiting for the Messiah has a very long history. We can turn the pages of history all the way back to Egypt some 4,000 years ago. This was 2,000 years before Jesus came. In those days, the days of Abraham, when they worshiped many gods, the people eagerly awaited some expression, some revelation from God. There were lots of people who claimed to be God, such as the Pharaohs, but none of these really satisfied the people. Another group of people, the Persians, had a similar kind of hope for a Messiah. 500 years before Christ was born, Buddha claimed to be the enlightened one, but the people still expected a Messiah. The Muslims, the Greeks, the Romans all looked for that day when God would step into history in the form of a deliverer who would solve the problems of evil and sin and suffering, who would make things right once again. And this was not an idle hope by any means. The scripture says that from the foundation of the world, God proposed in his heart that he would make himself known to us, that we might know him as he is, and that we might become his children. And so, long ago, God started a wonderful process of revealing himself. And here's how God did it. God chose a man about 4,000 years ago. Why God chose this man, we do not know. His his name was Abram, later changed to Abraham. He lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, one of the highest levels of civilization this world's ever known. They had such modern conveniences as air conditioning in their houses by running cold water from the streams into the house. They had indoor plumbing that carried off the sewage. They knew something about higher mathematics astronomy and geometry. These people worshiped many gods and no doubt Abraham did too, at least at first. But God spoke to Abraham and said, get up out of this place. I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you later. I will make a covenant with you that I shall be your God. You and yours shall be my people. So Abraham obeyed. He went And God promised him that he would possess all the land of Canaan. He also promised Abraham that his descendants would be like the stars in the sky, like the sands of the sea. And God also said that through him would all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, think about this. 4,000 years ago, this happened. The land was taken from them in 70 AD by invaders. That was about 2,000 years ago. The people were widely scattered, but they remained uh, united in blood and religion and promise and purpose. Now, in our own lifetime, this nation has been born again, and those descendants of Abraham have a homeland. What God promised Abraham 4,000 years ago was not an empty promise. 
There's no other nation, no other land on the face of this earth which has a history like this. God has been working his purpose out in history for a long time. This is the way it was about the coming of Jesus, God's Messiah. Prophecies were written centuries before Jesus was born, not after he came. I want us to look together this morning at three truths about the coming of Jesus, which were foretold long before they actually took place. The first, how he was to come. In Isaiah 7, 14, we read, The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. But let's go back even before that, to the first book in the Bible, to the book of Genesis. In the early pages of the Bible, we have a beautiful story of God's creation. And then a story of how sin came into the world. Satan in the form of a serpent, spoke to the woman and he said, eat of the fruit of this tree. Eve yielded and so did Adam. They rebelled against God. Then there's this statement, because sin has come into the world, there should be suffering and death. Listen closely now. But the seed of woman shall bruise the head of the serpent and his heel shall be bruised in so doing. That's Genesis 3.15. What does all that mean? The rabbis could not understand it. They didn't know all about the process of birth. They knew that man had a seed. But what about this seed of woman? Surely this was an error, they thought. But to know, but today we know that there is a seed of man and what might be called a seed of woman. And when these two seeds are brought together, life begins anew. Do you get the point? 4,000 years ago, the writer said that this Messiah would come from the seed of woman. Genesis 3.15 does not say the seed of man and woman, nor does it say the seed of man, but it says from the seed of woman alone. And so when it was announced to Joseph and Mary that their child would not be from the seed of Joseph and Mary, there would be no earthly father, but from the seed of woman only, it says that this child, this man, shall bruise the head of the serpent. With his heel, he will destroy sin. This is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. But in so doing, it bruised his heel, so to speak. He died. He suffered. Surely the early writers of the Old Testament had no idea from their own thinking process that there would be a Messiah who would suffer, that he would be bruised. But Isaiah also wrote that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. You see, God led those men to write what they did. The Bible is divinely in inspired. And so now things are beginning to fit together. The scripture told beginning 4,000 years ago how he would come into the world. He would be born of a virgin, the seed of a woman, bruised for our iniquities. But the prophecies also tell us not only how, but the place where he was to be born. Micah 5, 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth, ruler in Israel. Bethlehem was so insignificant, so little, so unimportant. And yet here is where another great miracle in the story of Jesus unfolds. You see, Jesus was not from Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph were not from Bethlehem. They were from Nazareth. Look at the wonderful way in which God arranged to have Jesus born in Bethlehem, as the prophets had predicted thousands of years before. Here was this king, Herod, who really didn't care a thing in the world about God or his purposes. Herod ruled for 40 years, 
And in all of his career, only one time did he call for an enrollment and taxing of his people. Only one time. And just the right time, God used Herod for his purposes. And so Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem from their home in Nazareth. Bethlehem was their town of origin where their family had come from. And it just so happened that this trip was made while Mary was expecting. Now to add miracle on top of miracle, look at something else. Have you ever wondered why Mary didn't have the baby while they were 10 miles up the road? Or why didn't the baby come after they had finished their enrollment for taxes and when they'd already started on their trip back home? Why was it that at that particular time, when they were in Bethlehem, that the birth took place? Was it because Joseph and Mary planned it that way? Were they trying to make the hope of the prophets come true with historical accuracy? <laughs> even the idea of such is absolutely absurd. Let me ask you, even today in our day of scientific advancement, what doctor can tell you one year from now you're going to have a baby. Or even after the child is conceived in the mother, what doctor can pinpoint the exact date or even the week for normal delivery with infallible accuracy? What doctor could tell you one year before a child is born that it'll be a boy? Well, you and I know that it was not just one year. It was hundreds of years before Christ was born that this was all spelled out in detail. The hand of God wrote through inspired, inspired writers to say, I'll tell you how he'll be born. It'll be of a virgin. It'll be a male child. I'll tell you where he'll be born, in a little town called Bethlehem. And you know what? It happened exactly that way. But there's another uh, part of this hope that led to Christmas. God also told us why he was to be born. You and I were brought into this world by our parents with a desire that we might live. We have within us this urge, this strong desire for life. In a sense, God brought Jesus in the world, into the world to live. But his main purpose in being born was not to live, but to die. This is reflected in everything we're told about him. Someone counted and found that there are 89 chapters in the Bible that tell about the life of Jesus. And 30 of these chapters tell something about his death. One third. A biography of Winston Churchill fills several volumes, but there are only three pages that tell how he died. All the rest deal with how he lived. We are born to live. Life is what's important to us. Not so with Jesus. He came to this earth so that he might die on the cross to deliver you and me from our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He died for our sins to save us from ourselves and to bring us back to the Father who loves us. From the earliest recording of man's history, there was a hope for a Messiah and a Savior to come. God saw our need as he fulfilled that hope with the coming of Jesus. Today, that hope is not a future expectation. It is a present reality as Jesus lives in us. But sad to say, there's so many today who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we who live in America take so much for granted when we assume that most people have heard of Jesus. Paul Eshelman tells of an experience he had when he went to Uganda. These are his words. It was a hot, dusty day when we rolled into the little village in northern Uganda. The men had left at first light to take the few scrawny cows to water. Only the women and children remained behind in this little cluster of thatched roofed huts. About 20 women and children shyly made their way toward us. The children were mostly naked. Many had swollen stomachs and 
and, and thin limbs evidencing the first signs of mal malnutrition and disease. The stillness of the morning was punctuated by the rhythmic thump of a young girl who was pulverizing grain to make cornmeal. Flies crawled across the dirt-smeared faces of tiny babies who were tied to their mother's backs. Through our interpreter, I began to ask them one by one to tell me what they knew about Jesus. As the question was asked, they simply shook their heads. They knew nothing. A little eight-year-old boy stood in front of me. Ask him to tell me anything at all he knows about Jesus, I told the interpreter. As my question was repeated in his language, a big tear began to roll down his cheek. Sir, said the interpreter, he would like to tell you about Jesus, but he's just never heard his name, said the interpreter. Paul Eshelman thought to himself, that's not fair. In America, there are hundreds of chances to hear the message, message of Jesus and God's love every day on radio, TV, other means of communication. Didn't this little boy deserve at least one chance to hear? I think it's quite appropriate that in many of our churches, all denominations, as we begin this Advent season, there's an emphasis on missions that good news that we have heard can never be kept to ourselves, not if we're obedient to our Heavenly Father. There are so many in this world who do not know Jesus Christ as their own Savior. What can we do to help send the gospel? One missionary from Zambia said, send clothes to us with missionaries in them. Yes, some can go as missionaries. Some can give to support them, but all of us can pray that God would stir our hearts and give us the thrill that comes by being involved in whatever way he calls us. Paul wrote to the Colossians saying, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the hope that led to Christmas. And today you can have that hope fulfilled as you allow Jesus to come fully into your heart. Perhaps you've already taken the name of Jesus, but maybe you've wandered away. Wandered away. You can come back right now. And if you're not a Christian, there's no better time than the present, right this moment, to surrender your life to Christ today. Father, we thank you so much that you have given to us Jesus, who is the hope of the world, the hope that led to Christmas, the meaning of Christmas itself. So we pray, Lord, that during these coming days, we might experience the hope in our own hearts and know that it's something not to be hoarded or to be kept within us, but to be shared. So give us that privilege, we pray, as you open doors to let us be your messengers to share that hope with others. This we pray in the wonderful name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.